If you want news or rumors that appeal, welcome to the dust. If you want news or rumors that appeal, welcome to the dust. Hey, welcome back to the Dusty Wheel. Hey, welcome back to the Dusty Wheel. I'm your host, the Innkeeper, and this is our live call and talk show all about the Wheel of Time. Now, you're here tonight to talk about gaming and the Wheel of Time with Glenn. And we'll get to that here shortly, but I want to remind you that tomorrow we're dropping another episode of Barside Chats talking all about why would anyone want to be a warder with, of course, our special guest, Malkir's King. So be on the lookout for that new Barside Chats episode. And then this Sunday, we are back with Kate Redding and Michael Kramer at the Dusty Wheel. Yes, those two individuals who are the narrators of the Wheel of Time and also of Brandon Sanderson's work and others. We can't wait to have them back here at 4 p.m. Eastern discussing their work, what's going on, and it'll be live. So make sure you're here with us on Sunday. And then I want to make one more note here. We have our next watch party has been scheduled on May 2nd at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. Joelle Bentoliela is coming to be with us. She's the writer and director of Starboy. That's a movie starring Barney Harris from the Wheel of Time on Amazon Prime cast. We're going to do that over on Twitch at the Dusty Wheel. I can't wait. It's a 17-minute independent film. We're going to watch it all together, and then we're going to discuss it with Joel. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be fantastic. It's something really unique, again, because it's a, it's a show that's still going through to the film festival. So, yeah, please show up. Please be back here on May 2nd with Joel and I, and we're going to be talking all about the show, and the phone lines are going to be open, too. So... That's going to be awesome. And, okay, that's it here. What's going on? And you're here to actually talk about gaming in the Wheel of Time. So first, let me introduce my guest who has written, designed, directed, and produced award-winning computer games for the last three decades, collaborating with such authors as Margaret Weiss, Tracy Hickman, Terry Brooks, Piers Anthony, and, of course, Robert Jordan. And most recently, is the author of a young adult fantasy series, The Chronicles of Chaos. And when he isn't writing or designing, he ends up teaching a summer course on video game design at UC Berkeley. So that's enough of, I think, let's just get to know Glenn, welcoming him to the show. Welcome, Glenn, to the Dusty Wheel. How are you doing tonight? Hi, I'm I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I know you and I have, it's funny, before the show, we started getting into discussing discussing the Wheel of Time and the game and all sorts of things, and we had to kind of like put it on pause for a moment just so we can get to this moment and actually jump into it. So I wanted to do that for fans that have never played or maybe known that there was a Wheel of Time video game produced and put out there. I don't know if you can give a summary of what that was. What is the Wheel of Time PC game that they've heard about? Well, um, it's a first person shooter. Um, it was a, it came out about the same time as um, Unreal Tournament and, uh, and Doom was already big. Um, yeah. And um, it, it was, it, it took um, sort of the first person shooter mechanics and it melded them with the mechanics that I was also in love with at the time, which was Magic the Gathering. And so I wanted to create an experience that was less about making sure that someone is in your crosshairs and making the, the player make a, um, an important strategic decision about what he wanted to do to his opponent. So um, the way I always described it was, if you see something floating at you, the slower it is, the worse it's going to be when it finally hits you. <laughs> uh, so, so you better do something about it. And so, a lot of those, a lot of the um, the spells 
or spells, the, the Tyrion Grial effects, um, were homing. And so they would follow you. If you could try to run away from them, you could try to figure out what to do, but they would eventually follow you and they got faster and faster. But you could reflect them, you could absorb them, which gave you the Tyrion Grial of the person who was casting at you. And so it was, it was primarily a, um, it was a, a combat game at its core, but um, it was bigger than that. So I'm, I'm a big story guy. I came from you know, adventure games. In fact, you know, it, Wheel of Time was going to be an adventure game before it, it turned yeah. into this. Right. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that it had you know, a lot of story. And for first person shooters, that was kind of a big deal back then. First person shooters didn't have a lot of story. They didn't have even, you know, realistic environments um, to, to explore. And so that was one of the things that Wheel of Time was, was really well known for. But I also wanted um, to do, I wanted story, I wanted the combat, and I also wanted something else, which was the Citadel mode. And that means you could build out an environment before somebody else came in to experience it. Because, you know, being yeah. able to construct something for somebody else to, to experience, this was before user-created content was even a thing um, back then, or it was just starting. But what I wanted was user-created content that um, people um, didn't have to be good at. So <laughs> you could be a right. level designer and have no talent at being a level designer and still create something cool that no one had ever seen before that somebody else was going to have to face. And so that became Citadel. And that was the, that's the multiplayer kind of side of this? Or was the Citadel also something, I mean, yeah, maybe explain to people what, how the Citadel kind of worked into the gaming experience. Right. So there were elements of Citadel in the single player experience, but more like just sort of training you how to set traps and place troops and things like that. But um, it was mostly multiplayer, and, and that's sort of that's the thing that gave Wheel of Time its legs. Um, the single player it was really well received, had a, a great story, had a really good experience. But the, the multiplayer that's where the clans were made. That's you know that's really what attracted a lot of attention to it. And and again, people are still playing it to this day, which is kind of amazing. That's crazy, and I I mean that's kind of a quick segue. We can go, we can jump over there. Okay, if, if someone just heard that there's people still playing this multiplayer version of the game, how do they find that? Is there a link that we can leave for them afterwards you can send me? Like, uh, where do people go and find this multiplayer uh, gaming um, system? Yeah, the, the place to start, I think, would be um, the two Facebook groups, um, the Wheel of Time PC game and the Wheel of Time FPS game. Um, there are people there who have been there forever, and they're really welcoming it's, it, I, I won't say that, you know, you can, again, look online and, and see a server always running, but there are enough people who have that, you know, who, who still have that drive, have that memories of, you know, the time they spent in a Wheel of Time clan that they want to boot it up and they want to play it again. So it, it does keep happening where people have, I think there was just a, a, a party sometime recently, but other people would know that better than I, I haven't actually um, dug into a game for a while. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I asked everyone on Instagram, and now, again, maybe Instagram, I don't know what kind of representation that is <laughs> for the Wheel of Time no uh, fan base. <laughs> All I know is, I think 14% said they had played the game before, and 86% said they hadn't, which hopefully those 86, some of those 86% are here tonight to know that, like, yeah, you can still find the game. I know I've had friends that kind of spin up some old operating system and are able to kind of get a patch to work. I haven't managed it myself, but to know that there is... You know, that there are people out there that are actually actively kind of getting together and playing the multiplayer version. Yeah, it's exciting. There are, I, I won't, I don't know anything about, you know, what's legal or not to do, but I know that it's very possible to get the game um, and get it up and running um, in a, with a, a recent system. And this is actually the game. Um, I mean, this is, this is actually <laughs> a nice. legal way to get it because I do sell <laughs> these things. I sell them signed. Um, I don't have that many left, but, uh, but I have enough that, uh, that I still occasionally uh, send them out so that oh, has so actually you, you actually have some of the boxes with the games in it. like you still sell some of those, those saying. and they're pristine because i had i mean so mike Verdu, the leader of our our studio um he made sure that if you designed a game you got boxes of them i mean you got crates of them so i still have uh, some wheel of times in the back which are which are wonderful because i mean you'll never be able to find them again so that that was yeah. pretty awesome well, shoot. I, yeah, I, I definitely. Now I'm interested. Let's get done with this live stream so I can get, I can find out how to get one of those. Yeah, I want to order one from you. That's, that's, I had no idea that you could still find those. So that's really cool to find out. Yeah. Uh, 
And as speaking about this, I know a lot went into this game. If, if those of you that are watching this interview, I have a link in the description. You should go read the Wheel of Time story that Glenn wrote. Uh, it's, yeah, it's really involved. It describes a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about in more detail. But what I find is fascinating is it shows the process you went through, Glenn, of having the initial adventure idea that you had, uh, you know, getting in contact with Robert Jordan and watching that kind of idea morph into what finally made it out here to us as fans. And uh, that's a really that's a really cool story. And like I said, we're going to focus on some of those pieces, but make sure you go read that afterwards. It's, it's great. Uh, it's great to hear kind of how this all came, because it's almost like uh, you get you look back in the kitchen <laughs> And it's yeah, not, you get to see how the sausage is made. Yeah, it's not pretty. <laughs> it was not pretty from from what you described, at least. No, um, it was it was like warfare trying to get that that game done and out. Um, and the link is mysterium.blog, If anybody, um, yeah, okay, doesn't, yeah. doesn't see the link anywhere, but uh, but there you can find everything about me and and not just about Wheel of Time, but all the games that I've worked on and, and a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, this is great. Uh, and that's really exciting to find out that you do have some copies left. I can already see some people like in chat <laughs> saying, hey, that's I, I want one of those. Absolutely. <laughs> so that's really cool. Uh, now, jumping back to kind of the sausage of making this game, I wanted to ask you about that. One of the things I'm sure fans are watching that are really interested about is your interactions with Robert Jordan, for example. Uh, so you, I know you've worked with other authors, Margaret Weiss, Tracy Hickman, Terry Brooks, and others. Uh, but when it came to Robert Jordan, do you have, you know, maybe describe some of those events when you met him and what that experience was like? Initially, working with Robert Jordan was terrifying. Um, and, <laughs> sure. and, that's, and that's because he wasn't quite sure what he wanted out of this whole process, but he knew what he didn't want. And that was kind of our first presentation was not what he wanted. He didn't want, and in, in some cases, I was actually really impressed with um, how he looked at how popular the game could possibly be, you know, how, how much of a success it could be in the marketplace. Because we described, um, he saw our adventure games, and they did reasonably well, but they weren't blockbusters. I mean, the adventure game um, genre, I think, was kind of sort of on, the, on a downward trend even then. They were really good adventure games, but there was only a limited market for them. Um, and so he saw that, and he said, I, that's not what I'm interested in. But I had already been working on this kind of this, uh, the core concept of the Doom meets Magic the Gathering sort of thing. And, and I, I sort of wrapped that in with kind of a, an RPG experience. And I said, well, you know, let's, let's keep talking about the adventure game because that's something that our, our, um, the, the investor really wanted, Random House. They really wanted low cost adventure games. Yeah. But I said, you know, there's this other thing maybe we could think of for a sequel. And he said, yeah, that's what we're doing. And so I said, <laughs> oh, okay. So now I have to figure out how to invent a wheel because we had never made a game anything close to that. We didn't have the technology. We didn't have the infrastructure. We didn't have the people. We didn't have the artists. We didn't have programmers. We didn't have anything um, yeah. except, you know, a good idea and the license. Um, so, uh, so I made some screenshots that were complete fakery. Um, I mean, it was basically artist renderings of what I thought it could look like. And we went around looking for money for it. Um, but but the interaction with Jordan, I think, was key to figuring out what was the right direction to go for the game. And, and a lot of people, I mean, uh, fandom, you know, they have their ideas about the way this this game should have gone. A lot of people wanted an RPG. I think a lot of people still probably want an RPG. It kind of sort of is sort of a uh, um, an obvious direction to go with the property. Um, this was something I was really passionate about. I thought I could tell a story, a really good story in that. I knew that it, the, the action would be compelling and he agreed. Um, so so I'm, I'm really happy with where that ended up. Um, I, and I made a game that I think you've said, um, it's the game I'm most proud of making in my career. Yeah, so I wanna kind of cover those two questions. I wanna get back to this idea of it being the most one you're most proud of. But uh, first of all, I have a question about Robert Jordan. Where did you see that he, you know, obviously is, he cared about the kind of game, the kind of experience. Mm -hmm. uh, when it came to refining elements, were you still, were you sending him art and was he seeing, you know, it was like, this is a Trolloc. And was he actually saying, yes, looks good. Or was it more, he'd established the kind of game he wanted and then you guys just had carte blanche to go and make it the, make it that way at least. Yeah, we, we had occasional meetings um, with him, but he was not too in the weeds. Um, gotcha. and, and I think that was because he knew he shouldn't be. Um, I mean, he, he, there were th certain things that were important to him. 
Um, but you know, designing an FPS is probably not one of them. <laughs> um, so, um, I, and, and to the point where what the first time we showed him the final product, I was again, terrified sure. because I wasn't entirely <laughs> sure how he was going to react to it. And after the, the intro played and I was sitting there going, what's he, he didn't say anything through all of it. And finally he said, you know, it, it was actually, he didn't say anything. I think his wife said it was beautiful. And then he said, Oh yeah, yeah. That, that <laughs> looks good. <laughs> Um, but I, I love that. The, I love that Harriet spoke first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She was like, you should say something now. Um, and then when we started playing it and showing him um, some of the levels, um, it was yeah. really interesting because he focused not on sort of the combat, not on sort of the, uh, the mechanics of the game. He focused on all of the little details. Mm. So one of the things that was really important about this game to me was creating these environments that felt like fantasy art come to life. And I had some really, really talented artists and level designers at the end. You can read about how, how hard yeah. it was to find some of these people. And that, <laughs> it took a while. The story yeah, behind, yeah. It, it, yeah, it was hard. But the end result was, <laughs> were environments that were really detailed, really um, drew you in. And we walked up, we were walking up and I was about to pick up a Tyrion Grial and go and fight the first character. And he's like, no, 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 what's that over there? And we went, there's a <laughs> pond and it had lily pads on it. And it had fireflies floating over it. And he sat there and he stared at the fireflies and then gave me this, this speech on how the <laughs> smallest details can make the biggest impact on people. And so that was, that was really kind of cool to yeah, have Robert that, Jordan yeah. telling me sort of how right, his right. process works and how he, saw, he thought we brought that same energy to our game. What's great is that uh, the story you just described is exactly who we all imagine and believe he was, right? Like, he cared about those little details. And that's great. To, you're like, look, there's this Terran Grail. And guess what we're going to do with it? We're going to chuck this stuff, whatever. And he's over there like, let me see the lily pads. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that, is, that is an awesome story of Robert Jordan. And to the T, I don't think that fits it. And I, and I can see what you meant by he wasn't there to kind of design the necessarily the game mechanics themselves. But he wanted to make sure that it, the world was rich in specific ways that he was that he thought of it, that he saw the world. So. And, and he was very involved up front. I mean, it's one of the reasons the game became a prequel, um, because he didn't want us messing around with a lot of the characters that he was still writing for and the world that he was still writing for. And so by making it a prequel, we kind of, you know, just sidestepped a lot of that. But I also was able to give him something that he really wanted, which was a female main character. So in sure. the adventure game um, that I was designing, it was going to be Ram. Um, but um, in this one, I, I initially designed the game to have four main characters, one of which was Elena. And, um, and it ended up, and I was going to do two entirely uh, separate stories, one from the Forsaken's um, um, perspective and one from Elena's perspective, and ended up having to completely check the Forsaken because we just didn't have time or budget or, or anything. Yeah. But the I, but the fact that I was able to give him a, a female main character, which I really felt good about, um, and I actually think we won awards because of it, because of not a lot of other um, games at the time were doing that. Um, sure. So that was that was one of the things he was pushing for, and I was I was happy that that it turned out that way. Yeah, that I think I really loved that it was a prequel. First of all, because it surprised me a bit as a you know as a gamer, I was thinking it was going to be more of an adventure kind of thing. Uh, and so for it to be something disconnected from the story, but still in the world, I actually preferred because I didn't have any kind of, uh, I didn't have any investment in those characters, right? And so I, I wasn't concentrated on like, did you get, you know, is this really Rand? You know, did you, did you get his character right? So yeah, I, I love that, that you ended up making that decision, that he was kind of pushing for that also. Now, jumping back to this idea that this is, you've already kind of described some reasons why this was one of your favorite games, but you have such a, long career in gaming why is this the one you're most proud of um well i think the fact that you're asking me that question right now is one of the reasons um <laughs> sure. i mean i've made a lot of games that so back in the day we made games and you know there's a box there's something that actually exists and right. you know people people still value this they still collect them and as time went on um we've lost that I mean, most of the games you have nowadays are in the cloud somewhere, and, right. and especially games like mobile games. So I've I've worked on um, massively multiplayer role playing games. I've worked on uh, mobile titles and social titles, and and some of them I'm, I am really proud of. But like, you'll never find 
Ravenshire Castle out there anymore. You know, it's gone. And 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 actually, I've I've had conversations with the development people who were in the development of those games, and uh, and it's really those who people who haven't gone through the um, I've made a box, and and it will always be a box and will always work. To I made a game and now it's just gone, like it never existed. Yeah. That's almost an existential issue. Um, so I love the fact that I, I made something and it has withstood the test of time, and we're talking about it now. But not just that. I mean, so you read the story, you know how hard it was to get it over the finish line. Oh, it gosh, was yeah. really difficult to, to complete and ship this game. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was my baby. I mean, from the beginning to the very end, it was me pulling it over that, that finish line. I mean, and don't get me wrong, there were tons of really talented people who were very dedicated and invested in that game. I don't ever yeah. want people to think, you know, I made this on my own. Because I absolutely did not. But I mean, the design decisions, all the tweaking, all the story. Uh, I mean, I even did a, a voice in there. Um, you know, uh, the, the art direction. I, I was doing things that people hadn't done before. You know, I was creating these environments that people had never seen before. Yeah. And um, so we were making history at the time we were making that game. And uh, I, I played it. It was the first game that I had ever made that I played for years oh, after okay. I shipped. Um, there, you know, adventure games, how many times can you play it? You know, sure. you, you, when you know the solution, <laughs> you, you pretty much, you know, that's it. But Wheel of Time, I was involved in a couple of clans. And uh, I, I, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a great experience for a really long time. Um, so I, I, I think we actually did a lot to affect the gaming landscape after that. And I th still think that there are ideas in Wheel of Time that people should still go after. People should still, you know, uh, try to try to get yeah, into sure. new, newer games. So I, something, something you just said about, um, yeah, there was some, uh, that endurance, um, the, the enjoyment that you've had with the game and it endured over many years. I think a lot of, there's a lot of games, right? I, you know, I, I want to think Diablo 2. I felt that way. <laughs> Starcraft 2. <laughs> there's, there's games in my gaming history where I would go like, yeah, they just endured and they're in my mind and I could sit down and play them. And the same way I think about Wheel of Time fandom, it's endured because people have really continued to enjoy talking about it. And yeah, you look back and go, anything that you can enjoy talking about for this long, it has to be good, if not the best or one of the well, best things. And, yeah. and you're, you can say it's good, but what you're really saying is that people made a connection with it. Sure. You know, it made an emotional attachment to it because it, it had an effect on them. You know, people tell me their, their, their craziest, you know, wheel of time stories, you know, when they were in a, in a Citadel battle with another clan and everything. And it meant a lot to them. Some people actually, found their married partners at, at, at land parties for a wheel of time. Sure, sure. Um, and it's, you know, it's to have been able to be a part of something that made an impact on people's lives. That's actually why I did this. You know, that's what, why I, I design games. It's why I write books. It's why I do everything. It's just because I want to make that connection with people. Yeah, and I was going to say, uh, and Taylor's going to, I'm going to have Taylor show some of the cutscenes that came in right at the end of the project. And I want to bring up this question while Taylor shows some of those for people to kind of watch as we're, as we're chatting. Uh, <laughs> there's a group uh, called Spankhole Studios that yeah. kind of, they, they saved, they not saved your bacon, they, you know, but, but they no, came they in. No, they did. Did they, they? Did. Is that is that fair to say? Okay, uh, that's absolutely fair to say. <laughs> they they came in and from how you write about them, you're like the name. Yeah, that's a <laughs> it's an interesting name. Uh, but unfortunately but they, named is what I said. Yeah, I think. unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately <laughs> named. But the work that they were able to come in and do at the very end, uh, you have a lot of stories like that. Like the cutscenes turned out so much better than what you had. You know, uh, you, when it came to level design, and you were talking about the history of this, and you're like. We, had, we couldn't find level designers until, but finally that last year seemed that things came together finally, right? GT bought Legend, that guy gave you, opened up some, you know, uh, made it a little bit less, uh, made the funding a little bit easier. We were no and, longer battling for milestones, which is yeah. not, you cannot make a game that way. And they finally took us in, we were an internal studio, and at that point we could actually just make the game. And yeah. yeah, maybe we'd look at the final number at the end, but we wouldn't be like, all right, well, let, how, how can we fit stuff into this milestone such that we can get paid? And that, yeah. that, that, was, that was ruining the game, honestly. Yeah, you were talking about how just the, they were coming to you and saying, we need to cut, we need to cut, we need to get this thing out, get this thing out. So I wanted to ask you about that before jumping you know, to a different topic, which was, was there something to this day where you're like, ah, if we'd had another six months, 
then everyone would have gotten this aspect of the game or another year where they hadn't really pushed us. We would have brought this to, you know, Wheel of Time fans that loved this game that was really part a heart and soul to the game that you had to cut. Did you feel like that about any aspect that you had to kind of shave off? Well, I mean, there's so many things that didn't make it into the game. I mean, it's really hard when you have to go to a level designer and say, well, this level that you have, it's only three fourths done and it's got to go. We can't finish it. We just don't have enough time. Um, We Mm -hmm. released actually a couple of single player levels after the fact um, because it was just like, why not? We had a whole portal stone level that no one had ever seen before that we released. And, you know, it wasn't perfect, but it didn't have to be at that point because it wasn't part of the box product. Um, But if you look back at the initial design for it, I mean, I was, I, I tend to be one of those designers that let's shoot for the moon because we're going to hit New Jersey. Um, but at least, but at least we'll hit New Jersey. You know, we won't hit like, you know, five feet in front of us. Um, I'd rather go big and not hit everything that we're going to hit sure, um, because sure. it's easy. It's easier to shave down than it is to build up because if you build up and you're just putting stuff on, you know, on a core that, you know, it doesn't feel very ambitious, then that's the kind of product you have. Um, yeah, and, and then there's so, there's so many kind of intricate stories there. And I want to get back to, we're going to continue talking about the Wheel of Time PC game. But I did want to take a moment, let's, let's, let's jump away from that a little bit. I wanted to ask you about what you've been up to since then. You know, I know you, one of the things that's really close to your heart is a, a series of, that you're writing right now. Uh, remind everybody what the name of that series is again. And maybe just kind of describe what it is for fans. Sure. So this is the first book of the series, um, The Child of Chaos. Um, I actually started writing this um, shortly after I did Wheel of Time, which was 20 years ago. Um, and it's because I, uh, we were looking for funding for Wheel of Time. And uh, we were doing a lot of pitches to a bunch of different um, um, publishers. And we went to Activision. And Activision told us, we love the game, but we don't like the license. We don't want Wheel of Time. We want it to be something that we own. And I hmm. said, oh, uh, okay. That's not usually what people, people usually get excited about the fact that it's Wheel of Time. And so they said, come up with a different premise for it. And so the night before I did the presentation, I came up with a premise and, and I pitched it. And we ended up not going with Activision, um, partially because they went with Quake, the Quake engine. We were with Unreal. And so that, that didn't mix. But <laughs> when, I was, when I was done with Wheel of Time, I went back to that concept, that premise, and I said, okay, is there a game here that I can do um, next? And I thought about it and I thought about it and I realized what I have here is not a game. It's a, it's a novel. And so for 20 years, I worked on that novel and that's what became The Child of Chaos. Yes. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, it's, that, that's what I really thought was interesting about your, as you were telling the Wheel of Time story, that, it, that this came from that moment of Activision actually saying like, we don't want the Wheel of Time, but the other ideas you have are cool, but give us a story, you know, uh, the, the varied uh, things you had to do as you led this project it just it sounds crazy the amount of coordination you had to do so the fact that you were up late writing a story to sell to activision to get funding for this game that you had been really excited about that was going to be wheel of time but ended up not because they went it's just it's insane and then it, the fact that it actually turned into a book for you um is you know, is, is is fantastic now i also saw that piers anthony uh actually did a blurb on the book uh, how did that feel so that was amazing. I absolutely did not expect that. I figured, I mean, we had worked with a few authors. Um, um, Piers Anthony was among them. And uh, he's one of the few who's, you know, reasonably approachable. I just sent him an email, reminded him that we had worked on the game on Xanth. Sure. And he came back and told me how much he didn't really like that game. <laughs> so <laughs> I had a little bit of damage control to do. Although I did not design Xanth, you know, I actually, I went after <laughs> the funny. license, but I did not design that game. So I didn't take it personally at all, but I did sure. say, you know, I, I, I agree with you about some of these things and, you know, wish you would have been more involved, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> um, but then I said, you know, would you mind looking at my, my novel? And he said, sure, send it over. And I sent it to him and, and he said in that email, I'm probably not going to get to it. I've been reading too much and hmm. I, uh, I need to write more. So I said, well, okay, you know, at least you'll have it. Maybe at some point you'll get to it. The next day, he no writes way. me back. The <laughs> next day, he said, I started reading it and it hooked me. And I just read through the entire thing. And he gave me this long review. 
And it not only had that quote, the quote from the, on, on the cover, it had bunches of quotes that I could take. He really liked the book and he's a known curmudgeon. I mean, he told me initially, <laughs> if I do give you a review, you're probably not going to like it because people don't like, people don't like when I, when I react to their, to their stuff. So I was just blown away. Yeah, you know, I, Piers so Anthony, awesome. I, I mean, it's amazing that he's still out there writing and, and, and active. I mean, I think he's in his nineties at this point. Um, but it's fantastic. He was one of my my fantasy heroes growing up. I mean, the the Split Infinity uh, and and that I think the Blue Adept series. Um, uh, he he wrote a ton of the the tarot stuff. And he wrote a ton of stuff that I that I really loved as a right. kid. Right, right, right. And well, so to have him, you know, one of my heroes come and tell me that he loved my stuff, that was just amazing for me. Well, for sure. And I love that he, I didn't realize it was so quick. I didn't, I didn't realize that part of the story, which is he got back to you the next day. So that's, that's, has to, and that has to feel good. How's reception been? Like, what have, what have people said? Are, are you writing more in the series after this first one? Kind of where are things at for you now? So yeah, the reaction to the book has been really great. You can see um, all the reviews on, on Amazon. Um, I mean, I, I had, I have a few notable people up there. Uh, Jolly Blackburn. Um, I, I got a. Do you know the the Knights of the Dinner Table? That's it's kind of you know uh, sort of in its own little niche, but it's a gaming comic book. Another oh, one okay. of my creative heroes. I sent it into them. They gave me a wonderful. I didn't expect a huge review f- from them, but they yeah. gave me a wonderful review. Um, so the reviews have been been really great. I'm really happy with the reception. Um, and yes, I think it's given me enough uh, confidence that people really like this world and th- and they and they do they they sp- say specifically they like the world so i have written the prequel to that um which is called game of war which focuses on one of the fan favorite characters from there dantes he's a priest of war um i really needed to know more about him for the the sequel and so i wrote game of war that's in editing right now um and i was really hoping that the the artist who's working on the cover would be here tonight i'm not sure if, if she if she's here or not um but she's doing a fantastic job creating the covers for me she's also one of the artists on wheel of time oh um, awesome. by the way she awesome. was a texture artist and i really really love the fact that i i, I love working with her so much that we sk- stayed in contact all this time and now we're working together again yeah so i, I was gonna say uh, how can fans i mean what's the best way for them to go and find this book if they're interested and they want to pick it up is it where should they go i guess look for it so there is an audiobook um um um, as well. Um, so you can go to Audible um, and find it there. Go to Amazon, find the ebook there. If you would like a signed copy of the book, um, go to my site, mysterium.blog, and it'll send you to my, my uh, online store. And I can write a message for you or you know whatever you'd like. And, uh, and those are pretty much the places to, to look for the book. Uh, and be watching for not only Game of War, but I'm working on the sequel right now. I, right now, the tentative title is um, curse of chaos well cool yeah so the child of chaos make sure you go check that out afterwards look into it sounds really interesting and fascinating uh and i know I, I, fans are like okay but what about the wheel of time pc game <laughs> and you just brought yeah. up the artist that was kind of helping you with that book and the textures i wanted to jump back to that which is when it comes to the wheel of time pc game that's something that i remember i was one of those people because as far as i know you were running the wheel of time.com website and i don't know if fans are watching this right now if you ever visited that website you'll remember that like gold looking i don't know a medallion or whatever it was the mm-hmm. snake around it and the jewel in the middle i remember going to that page and it, it had a counter on it <laughs> and the counter would tell you like which visitor you were and uh and they were like, you'd give away prizes or you'd have like contests to see who could, I don't know what it was, like every hundred thousand or something you would. And I remember all of us would sit there and refresh that page over and over again because there was something about it. I don't know what it was. It was like, it wasn't like you were giving away like a. I didn't give away anything. I didn't give away a single thing. If there wasn't, I swear you were like offering something. I don't know. Maybe it was just, I don't know. Maybe it was just cool to say. Maybe you just told people like, hey, Mark was our. Hundred thousandth uh, visitor or something no, like that. I, Maybe I, that's what it was. I did. I, it was. I mean, I gave away. I, I don't know if I actually called it this, but effectively, it was a no prize. And do you know Stan Lee? Mm-hmm. He used to in um, in in the comic books, and especially in I think Pizzazz magazine. No one probably has any clue what that is. But he used <laughs> to say he used to give no prizes. People would compete for no prizes, and it was no prize. So that's kind of <laughs> how I got that idea. It's like there is a prize, but it's no prize. 
Um, oh yeah, we, we we would sit on that page, man. I don't know if you realize that we would refresh because it would it would be really far away. You'd be like a thousand. You're like, I'm not doing this. But you'd come back the next day and you'd be like, oh, it's 500 closer. And you come back the next day and you're like, okay, it's within a hundred. I'm sticking around because we'd screenshot it. And then of course fans just were like, wait, we can just fake this with graphic <laughs> <laughs> software. So I'm pretty sure I was one of those that sent like, hey, I was the millionth. Uh, I think everyone so, wanted to so be the millionth visitor. B- before I address the people who cheated in that, in that contest, <laughs> let me just take one step back and just like, explain to people what you're talking about. Okay. So <laughs> um, when we were trying to find a publisher for Wheel of Time, um, we had no team, we had no technology, we had no engine, we had no nothing. Um, but we did have those screenshots that I put together and I was using those to try to sell the game. In the meantime, we had the license because Jordan had signed up with us. Right. Um, so I was just trying to build uh, build some kind of presence around the Wheel of Time game. I wasn't actually working on the game at that point. So I had time to actually focus on that. That was actually my primary responsibility is the Wheel Hilarious. of Time <laughs> and, and so I did that and I just, it was my first time doing any kind of community management, whatever. But I put up a, a bulletin board that kept crashing, it kept getting spammed and I would have to like re- code it by hand to keep it up, you know, just- <laughs> Right, yeah, I'm there with bunch, you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was horrible. Um, but people really connected with it and they became part of that community. One of the things that people really loved was my weekly, uh, I, I think it, it was always weekly. Sometimes I did it more, yeah. but it was my, my column. I came in, I talked about stuff and, and one of those things was the stupid count, counter, uh, counter contest. <laughs> and, and I, I knew there was nobody who was going to ever win anything, but people wanted it so badly that they cheated and I yes. couldn't believe it. And, and it true. happened multiple times. I mean, like a lot. To the point where, and all they got was me making fun of them. And, and everybody who got who cheated, I made fun of them. I, I, and I told them, I can't believe you're doing this. Why would you compete? Why would you cheat for a prize that doesn't exist? And so I would make fun of a lot oh, man, of it was, it was, really I have no fun. idea why. I mean, like <laughs> the internet in the late 90s, I don't know. It was just like, it was People just like were bored. Absurd, they were hanging out bored. on bored. Yeah, exactly. I mean, when you're refreshing a page for a hit counter that then you just want to see it hit a number, you know that the internet at that point was really relatively new and it was just fun to do stupid stuff. Uh, yep. So uh, before I, I have a, a bunch of other questions, I want to bring in uh, a, a caller, actually a friend of mine who wrote up kind of a, a did some research on the game and the history behind it and had done and wrote up an article about it. And I want to bring Vance into the show because I'm sure he has some questions for you. So let me welcome Vance to the Dusty Wheel. Hey, Vance, are you there? I'm here. How are y'all doing tonight? Vance, thank you for being with us tonight. Hi, Vance. So, so I'm sure you've heard the conversation up till now, Vance. I'm sure I haven't asked mm-hmm. all sorts of questions that you might be curious about. What question or questions <laughs> do you have for Glenn? Uh, I mean, first of all, I just want to thank Glenn again for all the help he uh, gave me when I was writing my article and video on, you know, the history of the game. And uh, like just it, it was it was so great to just be able to connect with these people who I've been reading about on like Wikipedia. And I was like, what? Now I'm actually talking with them, so it was it was this weird feeling, you know, of like <laughs> kind of going from secondary sources straight to the truth. Um, so it was it was just so so strange and surreal. Um, but yeah, uh, just man, Glenn, how does it feel to know that the Wheel of Time game ended up having a relatively massive impact on the games industry as a whole? I mean, because you all had a direct relationship with Epic and the licensing. And uh, even you wrote it up on your blog that you guys kind of seeded the idea to Tim Sweeney that this is how the future of game engines is going to go. Licensing out is the future business of being a game engine developer. Um, yeah, it was it was a really interesting time in the industry um, where, you know, big things were happening. And um, and that moment, you know, I'll, I'll never forget that moment when when he said that, that um, I mean, he just. He just looked at our level. Um, he looked at the level that actually the only level that I ever made in Unreal um, was that first level, and in, in it was taking one of the um, the prototype shots and turning it into something that was um, in his engine. And he couldn't believe it was his engine um, because we were using really high resolution textures. We had some really fantastic mm-hmm. artists, and and just from that perspective, I think. I was coming at it from a, a different place than a lot of like first person shooter designers, although that wasn't really a thing much at that point. But I was coming from a place of adventure mm-hmm. game design and art direction, 
where I had some really talented people on the hook who could make some fantastic looking things. And that's what I wanted to bring to the player. And so we created this thing with those incredibly high resolution textures that were not very feasible at the time. I mean, it ran like, you know, really slow. Um, <laughs> but it was it was enough that he could see it in his head that people would be in an environment that was real, that was, you know, like drawn from a cathedral or something you might see. And actually, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have anything to back this up, but Unreal changed a lot after that. I mean, there a lot of half timber mm -hmm. stuff sort of going in there and, you know, architecture that you actually found in Unreal. Um, I don't didn't start out that way because things were like, you know, Doom and and uh, Unreal were very sort of you know, gameplay oriented. The environments were very, you mm -hmm. know, some of these things couldn't even exist. You know, they would just, physics wouldn't work. That right. Way. But we created these architectural um, masterpieces and let you play in them. And I think he saw that and he was like, other people can do really interesting things that I just didn't think of. And there's money to be made there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, that was, that was a big moment. And, uh, and, I think again, making that game at the, I'm I'm the most proud of that game because of the of the moment we had in game development history, mm -hmm. because of the impact we were able to have. I wish it had done better, you know. It was yeah. it was up against Unreal Tournament. It was up against um, Quake Three Arena at the time, so yeah, it, it kind of got at that time, yeah. yeah. And I think actually <laughs> in some stores we got classified as a strategy game, which did not help. So we got put on the wrong shelf. Oh, yeah. So, you know, it just wasn't, it wasn't GT's main focus, Unreal Tournament was. And, um, but we got rated as like the most underrated game in uh, GameSpy at the time. And, you know, people loved the game. I wish it had just done a little bit better. Right. There any well, I, I oh, sorry, agree ahead, with that rating. Uh, I was just going to say, I agree that it's still one of the most underrated games of all time. Uh, especially as I, you know, did my research into it, I recall playing it uh, back in it had to be 2000, 2001, but I didn't know the name of the game, and this was before I even knew what Wheel of Time was. But I went to a buddy's house, hmm. and he had it up and running, and we played through like the first like two or three levels, and then I had to go home, and I never saw the game again until years later on uh, like YouTube video clips. Like uh, there's a popular YouTuber called Daniel Green out there, and he kind of reviewed the game and I was like, Oh, well that's, that's that game. I finally found it. Uh, and I didn't know it was the wheel of time game. So I was just blown away. Um, and you know, I went out and I found my patched copy and I've played through it again since. So yeah, it's just, uh, it's been great. So, sorry, Matt, we kind of started talking at the same time. Go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 no. If you, did you have, did you have like something, other question that you, the unreal one I, I wanted to get to tonight. So I'm glad you brought that up because it's a really interesting conversation. Is there anything else uh, that struck you either from your research Vance uh, into, you know, I know you, you found some notes from Robert Jordan or was there anything else that kind of struck you as an interesting thing and just a question you might have for Vance? I mean, oh, sorry. For, uh, before right. before oh. you, you dive into the question, let me one, answer one thing. You asked me if there was something uh, about uh, Jordan and the, the female main character. And at the mm -hmm. time, I didn't have an answer for you. I didn't remember what that interaction was. But it was because he was reacting to the adventure game where we had a main character that mm. was male. And then we moved into the, the female main character in the, for the first person shooter. And so that was that transition. He was looking at an adventure game with, with, with Rand. And so, um, so there wasn't pushback, corporate pushback, except for the fact that we wanted to do the adventure game because that's what we had. That's what Random House wanted to do. That's what we had already put a lot of energy into designing. And so it wasn't specifically about that. It was about the adventure game. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did yeah, he ever, did, did Jordan ever play the game that you're aware of? Did you ever see him play? I know you guys brought it to show him. I don't know if you've ever heard about that. I have no idea. I mean, I... It would surprise me if he would have gotten too far into it, um, yeah. because I don't think that was his cup of tea. I don't think he's a first-person shooter <laughs> fan. Sure. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think he was he was relying on us to sort of show him stuff in the game. That's what yeah, he based yeah. his opinion on. But he was Definitely. actually really excited about the future. I mean, he wanted to see where this thing could go. He wanted to, you know, see what the sequel would look like, and you know, he was he was excited about the the project, uh, not just what he saw in front of him, but what it could become. Yeah, that's really cool. That's that's very cool. And uh, yeah, Vance, uh, and you probably had a little bit more time to think about that. Yeah, any other questions that you have for Glenn? 
Uh, yeah, I hope I didn't start too many bad memories when I sent you that copy of the Facts of Doom. Uh, it was not my intention <laughs> if I did. I have it. I have a copy, so I'm very familiar with okay. it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I actually found I, that in a library. Um, and to my knowledge, I don't think very many fans have actually seen it. And uh, I, I don't think it's published out there yet, is it, Matt? Uh, I don't know if we've covered any I mean, bases I think with it's, the it's just, legality it's on the around great it. Light. It's on the Great Blight, but I don't think it's in the search engine yet. Okay. I, I was actually, I was this close to putting it into the story behind the Wheel of Time. And oh, then yeah. I just I just backed out at the last second. I'm like, I don't know if this is how how this will come across. Just like I didn't do the last couple of chapters. I just, it might be sensitive enough that I probably shouldn't. So yeah, at least it's sure. not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Sorry, go ahead, Vance. Uh, did, you, uh, did you have a question for me? I know you... Uh, before I let you go, do you have anything else? Uh, yeah, Glenn, where uh, where can I get one of these boxes again? Uh, <laughs> I, I kind of like to have a signed copy. Um, just go to Mysterium Blog um, and and contact me there, and I'll uh, we'll Perfect. work it out. All right, sounds good. It's awesome. Great getting hey. to talk to you. Yeah, Vance, yeah thank you very much. It. Yeah, thank you, Vance, for uh, and for holding on here, man. And I appreciate that. Yeah, that article's great. If you want to go check out the article that Vance wrote, you can find it at thegreatblight.com. Uh, it's a great, it's a great summary. But like I said, it links, I think, back to the whole history that we we're just talking about here. You should, you should go read them both. <laughs> That's what you should do. Hey, Vance, have a good one, man. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs> All bye right, bye. thanks a lot. Thanks for having yeah. me. Yep. Yeah, bye bye. So, I, and I, I want to everyone to know this is a live call and talk show. You've heard us say that. Uh, we do want to open the call lines right now, so let me throw up. Um, I'll throw up a uh, just for everyone on the screen. They can see this. It's one three one three talk watt or one three one three eight two five five nine six eight. If you have a question for Glenn about the history of the game, what he's been up to, his his the, the fantasy series he's writing. If you have any questions for us uh, about this, or just com- com- some comments, or you want to ask about gaming now and what Glenn's stars are, just please give us a call. We'll bring you into the show. And I, I, I kind of wanted to jump to that topic, and we can keep jumping back and forth like we have, Glenn. As far as gaming now um, and the sequel idea, was there ever any kind of push towards, you know, Legend and GT doing something else, uh, you know, a second game? Was there, uh, was there talk of it? Or... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I actually, I started um, doing some preliminary design work uh, for a potential sequel. But um, as I was doing that... Um, Legend got involved with Unreal 2. And so Unreal 2 was the sequel to Unreal. You know, it was Epic. Yeah. It was Epic's flagship product at the time. And um, and his, I don't know if you've read the story behind Unreal 2. It's almost, a, no, it is. It's a bigger disaster story than Wheel of Time. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it, was, it was really hard. We, actually, I would say it was harder on everybody involved, uh, Unreal 2. Oh, wow. Um, and so... Um, I ended up having to come on board about halfway through Unreal 2 and taking over that project as a game director. And so, you know, Wheel of Time didn't happen or Wheel of Time sequel didn't happen. And um, we were shut down after Unreal 2. So interesting. OK. Yeah. Yeah. That's well. Can you give us a do you remember what the idea was for the sequel? I mean, do you have any recollection of what you guys were thinking about doing? And how you're honestly, it it, it's been 20 years. Um, I, I honestly don't. I was actually thinking um, at the time more of like a mission pack um, because I just wanted to get more content out there for the people who were really into it, and yeah. you know more more um, maps for for death for for arena for uh, for citadel, and then uh, a story uh, involving the hound. And I don't remember how um, or what how I was going to use them, but I think that's what what I was thinking of. I certainly did not get very far. Sure. No, that makes sense. Um, and I see someone's asking in chat. We'll just take one quick break. Yeah, if you want to throw a question up, you can at me in chat. I'll try to grab your questions. I can't say we're going to catch, catch them all. We have some callers coming in. But yeah, I will try to zero in on some questions that I see that kind of will fit in and uh, yeah, and bring them to Glenn here. And also, if you happen to still be here and you're enjoying this, please do like this video. It's how other people will find this while it's live and afterwards. You know, uh, We'd love for you to like this. And if you enjoy live weekly wheel of time content like this 
please subscribe. We'd love to have you here for our you know, weekly drive all the way to when the Wheel of Time and Amazon Prime launches. We can't wait for that to happen, hopefully sometime this year. So uh, I, I want to, maybe I'll bring in a question here from chat that I've just asked, or that since I just opened that up, uh, someone asked any chance of a possible remastered Watt game? Is there anything, have you heard anything uh, out there that, that that's happening or would happen? So, so um, there's, a, there's a couple of things to discuss there. Um, people have actually tried projects like that, taking Wheel of Time and putting it into like the new Unreal Engine um, and actually made some progress. Uh, so there's some really interesting screenshots and I was really interested in seeing if anything happened there. Um, so anything that happens will likely be unofficial. Um, gotcha. the, the, I was actually really uh, hoping that, uh, unrealistically, that like good old games would bring back Wheel of Time. So good old, good old games actually got a bunch of legend products uh, and release them. The problem is, so Deathgate, which was one of my adventure games, yeah. it was up there for about a week and then disappeared. And that's because they realized they didn't have the book license. And you need gotcha. that. And that will always kill anything like Wheel of Time or Shannara or any of the things that we did that were based on licenses. Because yeah. they have the rights of the game, but they don't have the rights of the books. So I, we could have actually seen a new in, surge of people playing this game if it had gotten to GOG. And it, it's such a shame that it's, it's just not possible. Um, okay. so, yeah. um, so that didn't happen. Um, any new type of Wheel of Time game won't have anything to do with what we've done, I'm sure. If, they, if there is a game in production out there, I don't know about it. I know that occasionally people get the rights and they do something. They maybe try to do an, F, uh, an RPS um, and then it just goes away or rpg away. excuse me okay and it just yeah, goes it's, away. It's, it's very complicated right like from a licensing perspective and, and making this thing happen beyond the technical challenges of it so yeah maybe we can be hopeful but and i do want to say this i, I saw some questions there's people waiting here um if you're watching us on facebook hopefully you've enjoyed this first two-thirds of the show come join us over on youtube uh I hope you've enjoyed this. I guess it's more than a sneak peek, but I hope you've enjoyed this first part. But yeah, you can just find us over on YouTube at the Dusty Wheel for the rest of the show as we kind of take some of these callers. But thank you for those on Facebook that have been with us. Now, let me bring our first caller in and then we'll jump to a question in chat and then we'll bring our next caller in. Our first caller is Joe. Let me bring Joe into the show. Joe, welcome to the Dusty Wheel. How are you doing tonight? Oh, good evening. Thank you for having me on. Greeting from Cleveland, Ohio. Well, welcome. Thank you very much. And glad to have you. So what's your question for Glenn? Well, I don't know if it's necessarily a question, but uh, okay. as I told the screener, um, you know, one of the things that came about because of this game was the community. And that was driven by Glenn and the Legend Entertainment staff. And, uh, and one of the greatest things that came out of that, there was at least three that I can recall off the top of my head, uh, land parties. One was in Denver, Colorado. The other one was up in uh, Minnesota. And then, of course, the great one in Virginia uh, that uh, that I had a, a lot of hand in, uh, in in making happen. And so uh, it was especially grateful to uh, see Glenn and Sam. I'm trying to think of a couple of the other people that came uh, from Le Legend Entertainment. But, yeah, I mean, that's just one of the greatest memories I have. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I mean, I I don't remember doing any land parties myself for this game, but I did grow up on land parties, so that sounds awesome. And I and I'm disappointed that I would have missed this. When I'm kind of curious, Joe, were these land parties? How big were they? You know, what type of community would show up at these land parties? Uh, well, it was essentially the you know wheel of time uh, 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 um, uh, community members that came and um, a lot of it definitely focused on the multiplayer aspect uh not so much citadel as much as uh, uh arena um but uh you know the balefire wars were were fantastic um there were definitely people that came over there were a couple that came from overseas oh, wow. um yep. i can't think of his name right now uh the the one um but yeah, it's it's just definitely the community was was one of the things that probably and Glenn actually has has followed through on his even through um, his other uh, ventures that he's had. I know you know obviously he had the Star Trek Online stuff, yeah. uh, his book stuff, you know, and connecting with the fandom on his new book. So yeah, 
That's awesome. It was definitely good. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I, yeah, I think that's fantastic. Glenn, yeah, any thoughts here? Yeah, so back at the beginning, um, I really enjoyed playing the game, and I really enjoyed playing the game with like dedicated fans, especially people that I knew, and, and or I could get to know at, at some of these, these land parties. I just wanted to say my experience playing the game was, when it first came out, I was the best in the world. <laughs> because no one had played it. And that here I was, and it was cleaning house. And it was really fun for a little while. And then people got really good to the point where it's like I couldn't even put my own name. I had to have an alias because I, I didn't want to be too embarrassed if people just wiped the place with me. And, <laughs> and then even on Arena, I actually held my own longer than I did in Citadel. And Citadel, people were really good really fast and they were finding things that i had never even assumed i never realized that they could use some strategies in, in citadel and so the, the clans really started to own citadel and i was like i'm just gonna stick with arena for now until i you know until i get too embarrassed to play anymore but even so I, it was still a lot of fun so meeting the people who were like so much better i saw one person playing with a controller that I couldn't believe because if you've ever played the game, you know that the selection of the Tyrangrial is one of the most important things, and it becomes muscle memory. And seeing someone playing it as a controller, I thought was out just outrageous. I couldn't believe, <laughs> it. and he was really good at it. I think he actually won some of the games in, in the at the land party. So, so yeah, it, that that was sort of my experience. Yeah, that's really cool. That's, that's really cool. And Joe, yeah, I I, I agree with you. With these kind of um, just the Wheel of Time community itself, you know, whether or not it's around discussing theories or cosplay or whatever it is, you know, this one was around the gaming community. That's the fun aspect of all of this. So I love that that's the thing yeah. uh, that's that's kind of remained for you as uh, it kind of sticks out to you. That's and, and actually, let, let yeah. me just say one more thing. And yeah. that is, um, I absolutely agree. I, I think, you know, the Wheel of Time community um, in general is just, you know, fantastic. I I really enjoyed working with them and in, and communicating with them in when we were making the game, but the community that sort of gathered around the game was amazing. I mean, there were some really really uh, nice and and um, cool people involved that I really got enjoyed getting to know, and their support was fantastic. I I, I couldn't have. I mean, it's the reason that this game has stuck around so long in people's brains, but it was just, it was the reason I, I make games. And it's the reason I kept making games is because of people like that. So thank you very much for being part of the community because it, it made all the Oh, difference. you're very welcome. Yeah, very welcome. And one of the other things too was the support from the Legend Entertainment folks for the for the uh, map designers, you know, as part of, uh, you know, I was part of the uh, map designing, you know, to make some extra arena levels and, and things cool. of that nature. And uh, I can remember Matthias uh, for sure. I, you know, right off the top of my head is one of the guys that would always be, you know, responsive to any questions that the, uh, that the map making uh, community had. That's awesome. Yeah, Joe, that's, uh, that's, these are great memories and thank you very much for calling in to share them uh, with us. And thank uh, you. Yeah, man. Have a good evening. Okay. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Have a good yeah. evening, Boti. You too. Bye-bye. Thanks. Yeah. That's uh that's great to hear. Uh, Glenn, you were part of something really monumental and that's, that's what's awesome about this is yeah. Anything that kind of persists like that and uh, affects people like that, right. They want to call in <laughs> 20 years later <laughs> to make sure that you were aware of just how much, you know, that meant to them. I think that's pretty awesome. So um, I, I want to ask a question here from chat. I know we have someone else waiting for a call. We'll bring them in in just a second. Uh, Michael Moore asked in chat, he said, uh, what is your opinion of the single player's exterior versus interiors? Uh, I feel like the interior level design is much stronger. I've also wondered, I've always wondered why it starts outside. Well, um, so I think, I think that's right. I think the interior was based on, you know, existing architecture. And gotcha. so, you know, it's harder to make really compelling exteriors with the, as few polygons as we have to work with or had to work with back then. Now, you know, you've got, you know, some generators. You can just generate terrain and it looks fantastic. And it, uh, back then it was all by hand. And creating something where, you know, there's a horizon and nothing blocking your view, you could only put so many polygons on those mountains. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of the reasons that it was we had to, we put a lot of uh, pressure on our textures to, tr to hopefully you know carry the show there our trees were actually really i really liked our trees because they were planes 
to sort of overlapping at uh, different angles, trying to make it look full, mm-hmm. but they weren't. Yeah. I mean, they were just a yeah, bunch yeah. of planes. <laughs> Um, why did it start outside? And I, I think it was, I needed to get you into um, Shadow Logoth. And I needed a, uh, I needed you to learn some things before you did that. And so this approach, I don't think it originally was supposed to be the first level. I, I had some other stuff before that, but it, again, they got, they got cut. Um, so, so that's what I had to work with. And I think it ended up working really well. Actually, what I really liked in that first level was the moment where you see Shadow Logoth and the, the lightning goes off. Everybody has a little jump right there. And they see, yep. and like, oh, my God. And it set the stage in a way that I'm not sure, you know, that another scene would have. Um, yeah, so I really I, I really like that there. I remember that. That one was to, to play that game with the lights off. That was an experience. <laughs> I remember that. Just, yeah, and, just Shadow and then Logoth Shadow Logoth and, with all yeah. of the... The, the mist and the yeah, yeah. and the sound effects sound effects we did some really interesting things with sound effects especially for Mac and Shin. Um, yeah. that was a lot of fun yeah yeah the, the ways were, I just remember that being it was fun because like you said there were lots of moments that would make you jump uh, I do remember the kind of the different planes that you put the I can see that now like but I, but it was it was a cool way to do it right like right. it was less like wait this isn't full uh, you know at the time you know you're like that was that's an interesting experience but I do agree that the interiors are the things I remember the most. Uh, you know, those that you were able to translate so well into the Unreal Engine where it was like, wow, that is the picture that you had that was the, ar- the artist render of it. And then you were able to get it into the game and actually look that good. I still remember some of uh, some of those shots I can just still see in my head. So, yeah, that's uh, that will always kind of stick out as memories for me. Uh, let me bring in Lancer. He's on. He's uh, waiting here to talk to us. Let me bring in our next caller. Lancer, welcome to the Dusty Wheelie. How are you doing tonight? Great end keeper, as always, I raise my glass to you, sir. Cheers. And to our cheers. guest, of course, raise my glass to you as well, sir. And to everyone in chat, what's up? <laughs> I, what I didn't scream here because you would have no idea what I was doing, Glenn, which was I didn't scream the name Norm. Lancer is our cheers Norm here at ah. the Dusty Wheel. But Norm it is with us tonight. So, Norm, what question or comment do you have for Glenn? Well, I got a question. Since you know, now that the you know when this game first came out, the books weren't done. But now that now that all the books are done, you know the ending and such, and seeing how games have evolved over the last ten, fifteen billion years since they've been invented, how would you create a uh, a, uh, a Wheel of Time game with with today's influx of uh, incarnation of games how would you design a game today yeah and also using the story also using the story of of wheel of time now if you could you know knowing now you got the ending and everything oh, uh, yeah that's a big question i i mean i've i've been asked that before like you know how would you do it again and i'm it's it's a hard question the, the thing the way that i have always approached any license is figure out a core that you love about it and that other people respond to, other people connect to and figure out how to pay off on that. Cause there's no way you're going to tell the whole story. I mean, I did it in, in death gate. I condensed the, the series of books into, into one game. And I would not suggest doing that to anybody else. Um, <laughs> you know, it was, it, it came off, it came off well, but I had to cut a bunch of characters and I had to cut up, you know, I, I changed things and, you know, people don't like it when you change things. Um, true. <laughs> so, you know, you have to figure out sort of like, you know, this is, this is sort of weird, but I mean, I made a, a game based on Glee. Um, it was oh, really? Tap, tap, tap. Yeah. It was a, uh, a music game and it was kind of based on a Japanese a uh, game called Love Live. It was the same company. I mean, they they pretty much told us, you know, they, we wanted to use that as a model. But I had to figure out what appeals to that audience, the Glee audience. And I had never even seen a show. So I didn't know what, what, what was up about that. But I found things to really love in that show, things that I could translate into an experience. Even though it wasn't a story game, I was able to put story moments in there that, that brought it to life. Um, so today, um, uh, the other thing I would say is, you need a core that doesn't necessarily have to do that could live on its own outside of the license. So in a, an adventure game, you, it's sort of an adventure game. So you you don't have as much of that. But in almost every other game, you have a you know a some some core game mechanic 
that you just want to play. And so for Wheel of Time, you know, that is the angry owl, you know, the, the strategic combat, and then, then to the Citadel, because those things can live in a game, even if it wasn't Wheel of Time. Yep. Um, so for a new game, I mean, the thing that kind of appeals to me right now is, is VR. So I don't know yeah. what kind of game it would be in VR, but I think that that's where I would want to explore um, and see, you know, it's a, it's a, an extraordinary license. It always has been, you know, how could you bring in what people really want, what a kind of experience into, into a virtual reality game. So I, I love that. I love almost mixing that with what you had the game before being, before you had to kind of cut some pieces, which was, didn't you have like a storyline of the Forsaken? You had you had like four storylines. I like the idea that they could go back to that idea and give us even more than four storylines, right? There's so many places you could begin a story that would be compelling and interesting in the Wheel of Time world. I like I like the idea that you could um, mix what you already kind of had originally conceived with just the latest tech and then add a little VR into it. Yeah, I, I would love that. Actually, the original, original idea would be really fun to explore. The idea that there's a world out there with autonomous agents that you're interacting with and, you know, you're hiring people to spy on other people. And you know, it, it's kind of an MMO um, with a lot, a lot of really interesting uh, combat in it. But that always fascinated me. The autonomous agents that you could bring onto your side or pay off to pretend to be on someone else's side and things like yeah. that. A lot of that would be kind of interesting. Yeah, you could bring in like uh, Honor with the Aiel. You could bring in all sorts of kind of interesting components when it comes to trying to win over people or, or lose their trust. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that you could do today with the AI that wasn't yeah, really... Yeah, there's no way I could have pulled off back then. Yeah. So it's a good thing that I didn't get the go-ahead <laughs> to actually make that happen. Well, right. it's funny... I was shooting you, for the moon. <laughs> when you hear Glenn say the original... What I love is that there's like an idea, there's an original, original, there's an original, original, original. And it's a, it is a, like I said, you got to go read the blog because it's so layered, right? Like just like Robert Jordan writes these books, there is like the final thing that we get is a lot different than what you originally conceived. And it had a lot of pressures on it to make it into that thing. And uh, that's just the reality of life. Uh, but I'm sure, like you said, I, definitely I love video games. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the reality of life and, yes, very much video games. Hey, Lancer, thank you very much for that question, man. Any final question or thought before I let you go tonight? Uh, no, but a lot of people I know in chat had pets and stuff, so let, let, let the You want to let, let them ask it? Okay. You too, good sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> have, have a good evening, man. We'll talk to you soon, Norm. Good night. You guys take care. You too. Bye-bye. Yeah, it's a... Uh, that, that question of what to do, uh, I did ask kind of Instagram that same question of, okay, what do you want now? And mm -hmm. I think, I, I'm trying to remember what the most popular one was. I think it is just like, they just want an open Skyrim. I think the most popular one was just like a, a Skyrim-like yep. real-time world because it is really compelling. I mean, any of yeah, us have read the books. you can't ignore it. It's, it's kind oh, of the yeah. obvious answer. It is. And, it, and it's hard to not, it's hard to imagine that they wouldn't, it, you know, at some point, if let's say the TV series, TV series becomes really popular, not give us one of those. <laughs> There's so many fans just waiting for it without a TV series. Uh, I can't imagine how many people would love it. It's such a rich environment. They don't even have to go, they don't have to create Skyrim, right? Like they don't have to create a, it's already there. Like all the material would be there for them to actually fill in the storylines that you would need. So, oh man, I, kind I can of, see it. Kind of, I'm sorry. The, the issue with um, doing that, doing a translation of the books into a game is you've read the books. I True. mean, sure. what you want, and that, that Jordan actually made this point. Um, he felt that the star of his books was the world. I mean, yeah. certainly you That's want true. to interact with characters you know, you want big moments that you've read about and all that. And you want environments, especially that you've, you've visited. But to re-experience, I mean, I did a lot of this when I was doing adventure games. How much do you reinvent? Because people just don't want to, they don't want the book to be a hint book for your game. Um, so sure. it's a, it's yeah. a challenge and really what you want to do is give them an experience that they haven't had before, but they will really enjoy in a world that sort of pays off on what they envision it being like. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a great way to put it, which is whatever game they did come up with, the world has to be the star. Um, yeah. and so that's hopefully whatever, I don't know how the licensing is working right now, but whoever has the license or the, the, whoever picks it up from a gaming perspective, hopefully they, while they might not ha be able to go speak with Robert Jordan, hopefully they can continue to speak with 
Team Jordan, as we call them, you know, Harriet and um, his assistants, and hopefully that they capture that idea about the Wheel of Time because that's, yeah, the, the world is the star, that's for sure. And I see this question, I don't uh, necessarily understand it, but it sounds like I have some gaming terminology here. But Miss Sarah James asked, I'd love to know what Glenn thinks of procedural generation and its potential to create large, persistent worlds. Um, so, so procedural generation is fantastic if you seed it with, if it's powerful enough. So I've been involved with procedural generation for, for a while and there were games that were built. I mean, I think uh, even Diablo has procedurally generated dungeons. Hmm. Um, so it's gotcha. seeded with certain things, but you never quite know how the pieces are going to be put together. I see. And so yeah, yeah. What, what, what she may be talking about is something like that. What she may be talking about is like what I mentioned you know, landscapes being procedurally generated, you know, so that nobody modeled the, the grass and nobody modeled the water and nobody modeled the trees. It's just that you know that those things will exist because of a, of a model they have um, and, or a, you know, the numbers they have and it just is created. I think that stuff is fantastic. Um, you know, the, the, the closer you can come to photoreality, um, you know, the, the better and because it used to be you build a game like Unreal 2 and you'd sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. You, uh, you'd spend months working on a level and how fantastic that level looked. You know, you'd have, you'd have the fireflies, you know, you'd have the rivets and, you know, every single detail put in there and a player would blow through it like crazy. They wouldn't <laughs> look at anything. They wanted to shoot the creature and get to the next, the, the next goal. Right, and right. so it's like, you know, you can't not make it look great, but, you know, it's really disappointing <laughs> that people weren't enjoying it as they as it is, as if it were a piece of art. And so procedurally generating something means it can look great, but you also don't have an artist spending months on it. And gotcha. so I, I okay. like yeah. that part of it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And. Yeah, I, 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 cause as you're describing that person, that yeah, I, that's how I would game too. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, I, wasn't, would? I wasn't like Robert Jordan, like look at these lily pads and the fireflies. Let's take a moment. I was like, exactly. I want to pick up that Tehran Grail and I want to kill that person. You know, whatever it is. So. <laughs> yeah, you're a gamer. I'm a gamer. Yeah, exactly. You want a game? Uh, Michael Moore just asked in a chat. Said, uh, what parts of contemporary video games majorly inspired you while working on the game, other than F, other than like first person shooter games themselves? And it gave some examples like Realms of Haunting, Lands of Lore 2, Ultima Underworld. Yeah, were you, uh, were you inspired or by certain parts of other games as you were working on them? Um, so, yeah, I see that list. So Ultima Underworld was the first um, truly 3D environment. Um, you could actually, you know, look up and look down. And I was fascinated by that concept. I mean, it was before, I think um, Wolfenstein came out about the same time. And I was like, oh, this moves at a real frame rate. <laughs> Where <laughs> Underworld did not. Underworld was really slow. So the concept was great with Underworld, but I didn't think it, it paid off on what I, you know, the experience was, was more clunky than certainly something like Wolfenstein. But then it evolved to Doom. And that, to me, was like, that was a game changer for me, how I viewed anything. Um, Doom was was something that we lost probably hundreds of hours just playing it in the office <laughs> when it first came out. Right, and the same right. thing for Magic. So, I mean, those were absolutely my inspirations. As moving forward, um, I think I played Hexen and I got a feel for how they were doing fantasy. Um, and But honestly, I don't remember another game being as inspirational for the design for Wheel of Time during the development of Wheel of Time. We had our own challenges. We knew what we were trying to build. It was just a question of trying to get it done. Yeah, that uh, that aspect of kind of what inspired and what kind of captured your you know vision, if you will, right? Like that's again, that's that whole thing where you know uh, people will say, "Have you played this new game?" And I'm like, "I don't know, but I'd love to play StarCraft Two again." <laughs> right? It's like that thing that just pins you, and you're like, "No, my brain." Actually, actually uh, the thing you just said there is the the bane of every developer's experience. <laughs> Have you played that new game? And the problem is that the producer, the executive producer, or the you know the guy, the publisher, he has played that new game, and he's wondering why you don't have that feature in your game. Oh, and so gotcha, he's going to gotcha. come and say, "Hey, try to fit this in there." Like, That's not our game. We don't need that bullet point. We just need to finish the thing that we're working on. 
So I, I, I kind of I had this question just as a software designer for my entire life. I, and as I read through the process that you were going through, it felt very iterative, but also very top down kind of <laughs> waterfall, if you will, from a, a development approach where it, it was not agile. <laughs> you, yeah, you weren't you weren't going to get the agile there, but you at the very least it did seem like you were driving from a lean perspective towards a minimum viable thing. Now you yeah, didn't get to from determine the other direction. Many, yeah, from the yeah from the the waterfall minimum viable product right. product, which is more like you have no control over it, and you're like, we just built all other stuff, and now you don't want us to use it. Okay, great, and we chop it off here. Do you feel like there's uh, you feel like this is adaptation? Like that, the gaming is just kind of like the br- most brutal form of adapting a work into something like that. Where, yeah, it, it doesn't turn out anything like maybe what you had imagined, and you're changing things about it, and the the fans might not even recognize it. But it just is because, in the end of the day, somebody at corporate level said it has to be it has to do this. Is it just a, or or do you feel like you can still adapt material into gaming these days, or adapt like a book, and really still be I don't know, true is the wrong word, but kind of still maintain its heart and soul, if you will, bringing it so, into a game. Okay, game. so you asked a bunch of questions there. Yeah, yeah, there's um, a good time. <laughs> so let, let, let me see if I can address it. Um, first of all, the, our development process started kind of agile because we're doing prototypes. We're trying to figure out how to make the game that we needed to make. And it was really hard because the engine didn't do what we wanted it to do. Right. So we had to, we had to build a lot before we, we got there. But then I'm, I was used to adventure game design, which is you design it, you know, you ha- you know what the game is supposed to look like before you even start. And yeah. so I tried to do some of that. And then that's when we ended up having to, to cut back because we couldn't build everything that I wanted to build. Um, and so um, is it possible with the demands of development to do justice to a work, uh, uh, a, a license. So first of all, I'll say it depends on the person who's driving it. Um, so if it depends on what their priorities are. So I don't know how many other people, I'm sure, I know that there are lots of really passionate game directors out there who will do anything in their power to make the best game that they can make. Nobody sets out to make a bad game. Sure. That said, people's priorities can be different depending on what they think needs to be in there. And the way that I always approach game design is understand what the core is, you know, figure out what you need to have in order for that game to hold water, you know, because once you get past a certain point, it just collapses under the weight of itself. You know, it's not the game that you really needed it to be. And there are plenty of games out there like that, that, you know, you just, you know, that it didn't work out. (laughs) <laughs> you know, right, as, right, right, right. as it was supposed to. And I will say Wheel of Time <laughs> didn't, didn't, wasn't the game that I initially wanted it to be, but it was the game that I needed it to be at the end. You know, I was proud of shipping that game because yeah. I knew it delivered the experience that it, it was what we could do. Um, and I think it was actually more than we could do. People put in some crazy hours and a lot of energy, you know, a lot of themselves into making that game happen. And so you also need not only a game director who is willing to push as hard as possible to, to you know, game, game um, development is a, just a force of will, as I like to say. But you need a team who is there, talented and invested. And once you have those things, you can do a lot. You can get a lot done. You know, you have to make sure you don't kill everybody in the process. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I would not suggest, uh, you know, anybody working the kind of crazy hours that we did back then. And yeah. back then it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, work life was not as big of a thing as it is now. And um, sure. so I, I'm not, I'm not advocating people killing themselves, <laughs> but I will say that you can make trade-offs if you understand what you're trading off against. If sure. you, if you're saying, I just need a new feature because I need a new feature because another game has it. And you don't understand how that's going to impact the rest of the design or the quality of the rest, then you're not making educated uh, choices. But if you are there, like I, I've had, you know, on many games, not just Wheel of Time, I've had executive producers come and say, there's a problem and here's how I want you to fix it. I say, okay, stop at the first part. Tell me what the problem is. Don't tell me how to fix it because guess what? I have been living with this design for, you know, in some cases, months or years. years I right. know how to fix something such that the whole thing won't fall apart. But executive producers or publishers or whatever come in, you know, if they if they know well enough, then they know well enough to stay away. <laughs> sure. 
<laughs> yeah, no, so, that's a, that's a that's a great answer, and and you uh, rephrased it really well. And I think that's true. You know, it's a lot of, and the reason why I, I kind of uh, poked at that question, the idea was that's clearly what fans go through right now with any adaptation of their material, right? You talked about this as part of your process of like, oh, wow, you know, if I did an adventure style game of the books as they were, I was already going to have to cut things. And I was already looking at how am I going to sell this idea or how will fans interact with this? Obviously, with the TV series coming out, I'm sure that's that's everyone. Anytime you adapt any material, that's got to be on your mind. And you're, like you're saying, you hope that you have passionate people that care and are aware and have been in the material and really understand when an executive producer says, hey, make this change. They can see that kind of happening. So, yeah, that's a. it's interesting to see how this transcends any medium, right? TV gaming, whatever a type of adaptation you're going to do. So yeah, I just, I was kind of curious if you felt those same things and it sounds like it. Uh, I, I see two questions here in chat that I think are really, really interesting. One from Melissa, she said, you have a variety of talents, game designing, writing, narrating, <laughs> which skill comes the most naturally and which is your favorite to work on? Um, so it's it's got to be design. And when I say that, I don't necessarily mean just game design. Um, I really enjoy figuring out how all the pieces fit together. And so when it comes to writing, it's about, okay, how do I make this work? Um, th that it's compelling, that the characters are, are really interesting and, you know, and deep and the relationships are good, but the world is, is deep and fascinating and, and the plot works and is surprising and, and cool and all that. And all of fitting all those pieces together is something I really enjoy and it's you know it's it's uh i i'm and i end up fixing a lot of problems and that's sort of what happens in game design as well and i i, ha I teach a course on this um it's like you are constantly figuring out well i have a plot problem here or i have a design problem here how do i go about fixing it and you usually come up with a solution and if your solution solves more problems than it causes you know you're on the right track so just keep <laughs> doing that <laughs> And you'd yeah. be surprised at how many solutions cause more problems than you think. And that's like the executive producer coming in and solving my problems. You don't even understand what you're what you're breaking in this game if you do that. Yeah, I'm not surprised that's your answer as you go back and read that history that you wrote. Uh, every time you're like, I'd get to the end of a process, and I, I was like, I'm never going to do this again. <laughs> and then you're like, uh, and then I got, then I had an idea, and that's how it's. Uh, then I had it's an addictive. Idea. It's addictive. Sure. I mean, bringing something to life out of nothing. It's like that's. That's being creative. That's, you know, constructing something. Um, and it's um, the, the, the thrill that I got was not only making it. And for me in novels, it's kind of, it's me, you know, making it, but in making games, it's like, I'm, I construct something and then I hand it to somebody who's better than I am at something like art or music or, sure. you know, voice direction or whatever. And they come up with something and they bring it back to me and it's magic. It's more than I thought. Uh, and putting that all together, you know, being, having that be my game, um, but it's all of our games, but having it be the thing that was in my head, there's nothing like it. It's like making, I would guess making a movie as well. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And uh, I can see it. I can see the passion that you have for it again, uh, just in how you talk about it and write about it. So uh, this other question comes from Susie Redfern. She said, what are some of the biggest changes to the game that was ultimately released compared to your original vision for it? I know we've we've covered some of those, but is there something we haven't covered where, uh, yeah, you just remember a change that you had to make that was really painful, uh, but you made it anyway uh, from the kind of original to the final? Oh, yeah, we, we've talked about, a lot of them. I'll tell you one thing that I wish we would have gotten in there. Something that I, I wish we would have spent more time on. And that was the Tyrangriel selection process. Hmm. So I had, um, I think the, the selection um, design was taken kind of like from Half-Life at the time. Was, so you hit a number until you hit the one that you wanted. Um, and that, that worked. Um, and actually Sam Brown, uh, created a little utility that allowed you to sort of do it, create your your own keyboard uh, shortcuts and everything for it. But right. the truth is that it took a while for people to get it because there were so many Tyrangriel and so many possible offenses and defenses to, to things that I think that at the time when we released, I felt that was our biggest obstacle to getting new people on board because it just that that learning curve was just too high. So sure. uh, apart from all the content that we didn't get in there and uh, 
and the you know the, the the third pillar, which is autonomous agents, and all those things that I would love to see in the game. I think that's the thing I kind of would have liked to have made better. Sure, no, and that's a that's a good. I, I love that insight. Again, it's uh, something really specific to you. Yeah. Like, ah, oh, I wish I could have gotten that. It really <laughs> ticks me off, you know. Uh, so yeah, I love that. Uh, uh, the Bard of the Red Hand just asked uh, the soundtrack for the Watt game is quite unique for its era. Did you have any input on the direction or was it more of an outsourced deal? No, that was, so I wasn't quite sure how I wanted to approach that. I had, I'd worked with um, some sound people, um, Andy, who was actually in the, uh, in the crowd. He, he made a, a sample um, track that I really loved actually, but, but I wanted something different. I, and I heard this, I'm a big Jeff Tull fan and I heard an album um, that was a bunch of Jeff Tull songs done by other artists. And one of them was Robert Berry. And uh, he was kind of, in his own words, like the guy who almost quite, almost made it a number of times. He was actually <laughs> in a group with um, ELP, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, without the Palmer. He was, and they called it three to the power of three. Um, so he was really close to making it, but he never quite did. But he was an incredible musician who played everything. And I heard that song and I just thought, why not? I'll just give him a call and see what he's up to. Um, and I talked with him and he got really excited about it. He didn't break the bank. Um, I think he was just excited to be part of the project. And he produced some of the most incredible sound, uh, mu- pieces of music for the game that I, I could have expected. I really, really loved how that soundtrack came out. I, I, directed, I directed him in that I told him exactly what I needed. Um, he not only made the, um, the music for the game, he made, he scored a lot of the he scored a lot of the, the cutscenes, and actually, I, I think Andy might have scored some of the cutscenes as well, um, which was really cool. Yeah, that's uh, that's that, uh, yeah, that's a great. Uh... But he got so excited about Wheel of Time that he produced oh, yeah? the Wheel of Time album, um, which is a Robert <laughs> uh, a, a, a Robert Jordan or a, yeah, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, his all a lot of the songs he made for the game um, put into an album and released that. I don't think I don't know how that was received. But the fact that he he came up with a Wheel of Time album was really fun. He was excited about it. Yeah, yeah. I love yeah. that that's the after effect of it. Yeah, I remember, I remember that one. I think I've actually, we've talked about that when I did a show on music and the Wheel of Time. And yeah, I didn't realize that that was what the driver was for that album. That's that's really cool. Yeah, he just got excited about the, the license and was so into it that he wanted to do what he could <laughs> in that world. I, and I think this question, I think we're, we're tying up the show here, but I see the question is kind of interesting. I think it's for this game. Uh, the question is, is there a story behind the Abraham Lincoln painting that is in the game? It was so funny stumbling upon it. Uh, yeah, I commented on this on, in the, uh, the Facebook group. Um, oh, gotcha. so, the, so we had some quirky level designers, and they liked, <laughs> they liked Easter eggs. And I said, okay, if you put Easter eggs in there, you just better well – hope I don't ever find them because I don't want anything that's going to undermine the experience of the player. And so Lincoln's appeared in the levels, but never where you would see them. So you actually (laughs) had to like ghost through levels in order to get to a point where you can actually see a Lincoln. I don't know why it's Lincoln. They were fans of Lincoln for some reason. All the level (laughs) designers decided that was something they really wanted to to get in there. But on certain graphics cards, you could go into a room and see a Lincoln, which really i was not too happy about at all but there's nothing i can do about it it was after the fact it was out in the world i'm like okay i don't know anything about that <laughs> that's hilarious Lincoln. i like that you're like just don't let me see it just don't let me see it and you can put yeah. it in there that's, that's great exactly right. i want to know if there's just some easter eggs you've never seen like that's i'd love to know if the level designers have ones that just haven't been found yet uh, i know that there are some in unreal 2 there's a bunch of oh really <laughs> um, wheel of time I mean, we just didn't have enough time to do a lot of extra stuff. We had to get the get the thing, get what right. we yeah. had to do done. I'm surprised anyone <laughs> had time for an Easter egg, honestly. From now you describe it, I want to I want to end on this note, um, and I see this from Renee Rampini. She said, "Shout out to Andy Fraser." I wanted to ask you about that, and and are there some people just like Andy uh, you mentioned here who was in chat? Anyone else that was part of the project that you want to just, yeah, shout out, which is they, they kind of made a real big impact to and, and, and enabled you guys to be able to make sh- get this, basically this game done and out. Oh, my God. Well, I mean, the team, you know, it was it ended up being fairly large. And I I mean, I can name some of the people at Legend at that time. So Mike Verdue, I 
he was the one who sort of he was he and Bob Bates were the um, the studio heads, co-studio heads. Um, but he's really the one who was my mentor um, and helped me uh, do what I had to do to get the game out. Um, but Mark Pesh, um, he, he was our technical lead. You know, the Citadel would not have happened if he hadn't just buckled down and got it done. Um, we had uh, Paul Mock um, was the guy. I lost the art crew that was going to do all my architecture. They just left and they went to work on Blade Runner for Virgin. Oh, wow. And I was like, <laughs> oh, what do I do? All my architects are gone. And Paul Mock stepped up and he was one of our 2D artists and he just had a real flair for architectural design that I had no idea. Um, but he started, and some of the, the pictures he put together are on the, the blog site. Um, so he did so much um, work to, to lay the foundation, but Cindy Wenzel, uh, um, uh, and we had, we had so many artists on there that were just so fantastic and so, so talented. Um, the Shearers did our characters. Um, I, I mean, it's, I can't yeah. remember. Oh everybody. yeah. There's, yeah. You never remember. I was just curious if there, because that's what you do notice from the story you told, which was, you know, uh, you're giving us like, okay, and this is what I was doing. But then you're like, and all these people <laughs> and that were a part of it. And then we ran out of this money. We didn't have funding. They moved on to this project. Then they, they looped back around and they backed back at legend afterwards. And the last year, it was really just fascinating the overall story of how it all came together. So I know, like you said earlier, it was a it was a team effort, and and, and actually uh, along those lines, so our yeah. level design team was top notch, and I think all of them went on to like fantastic careers. This was Scott Scott Dalton and uh, Matthias Warsh and and uh, James Parkman, um, and you know, and and, and and a few others that were. We had a small crew, but they were fantastically talented. And they made some incredible environments. Um, and they all, like, I think Scott is working at Valve. Um, and uh, and Matt, Matt has done a ton of stuff. Um, so, you know, I, I, we, 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 we were, you know, sort of a forge of really talented people that they all split it out. And, and Legend was not a big studio. Legend was a tiny little adventure game studio. And, uh, but we happened to be at the right place at the right time with the right idea. And people yeah. were really attracted to that. We attracted some really great talented people because of that. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I feel blessed for being there at that time. Yeah, no, it, it sounds, uh, again, I, I think I told you I read that story a couple times and just things stand out each time. Uh, just a fascinating story. And I think it's something you mentioned that this is not a story that's unique to this game. <laughs> this sounds like it's a pretty Every game story is a miracle. In the gaming <laughs> industry. <laughs> Every game so, is, a, is a disaster. Yeah, absolutely. But but thank you so much for for being here. I, there's we could talk for another two hours, I'm sure, about this. But I really appreciate you taking the time out, coming and talking to us about this. Again, if you are interested, please do go check out is Mysterium dot blog, right? Mm -hmm. So Mysterium dot blog. We'll make sure that link is in the description of this video, and you can go, like I said, read up on the history, the Wheel of Time history. You can read up on the stuff about Deathgate uh, cycle, which I, I love. Margaret Weiss, Tracy Hickman. That's one of my favorite series. Uh, and then you can also read about the Piers Anthony review to, uh, to Glenn's uh, fantasy series. And yeah, make sure you check those things out and do reach out to Glenn if you're interested in one of the kind of remaining copies of the game uh, afterwards. So hopefully this isn't the last time uh, we get together and maybe we need to uh, work something out where we can play Citadel or Arena uh, somehow on Twitch together. That would be a blast. I'm into That'd be that. Awesome. <laughs> we got to figure that piece out. I, 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 I'll, I would I'll be one of that. the best players again. <laughs> yes, yes, you will, <laughs> because I have no idea. Like my son likes to, my son likes to laugh at me when I play first-person shooters because he's like, "Jumping does not help you." <laughs> and I'm like, "I'm jumping. I can't stop jumping. I'm sorry." And he's like, "It doesn't matter, but keep jumping. I can't stop." He just, he realized that was my, <laughs> that that was my go-to thing. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> "Look, I like role-playing games, not so much first-person shooters." Okay, so uh, no, I would, I would love to, I'd love to have you back and talk as other games come out and uh, inevitably right the like yeah. you said the license will get out there love to have you back and talk about those and like we said maybe do some live gaming together that'd be a lot of fun i just yeah. I, I dig it uh, i, I want to get back and see this game and and actually play it again it's been way too long so glenn thank you again this is a fun fun conversation it was a blast hopefully all of you that watched were enjoying this remember catch us back here on sunday Kate Redding and Michael Crane will be here talking to us about narrating the Wheel of Time. If you didn't see that interview last year, you should go check it out before that. It was a blast. Um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of fun, just as Glenn was here, and we'll 
the call lines will be open then too. So, well, thank you everybody. That's it from around here. You can catch us for an after show on Discord. We'll jump over there. At least I'll, I'll jump over and jump in and chat and, and continue these conversations going on. You can find the link to that in the title or if one of the admins is in chat, they will drop it there for you. And yeah, I appreciate everyone showing up tonight. And this is how we ended around here. Good night from the Dusty Wheel and smash to black. You went right to kill it. Look at you, you're all ready. You're just done. I mean, this is like, uh, this is really the well. Um, and now I'm like, great, my turn. <laughs> and if you don't like that, um, you want to say, well, Robert Jordan could have made the two rivers all white. He could have, but he Jordan. didn't. So okay. Just complimented me so, on my dress, and as you can clearly see, I'm sad. I just need to call me as color. something along the lines of a Shadar Haran analog. Or okay. It does make sense why it outlasted the breaking. Yeah. <laughs> See, yeah, you know, this is why like I have to res in the show because she's gonna correct everything that. Hey, everybody! I welcome to the Dusty Wheel really. Show. What? Beam off challenge! Yay! Like baby face mounted on like a huge body. So like all <laughs> this of is a not sudden, just a like, traditional wow. fantasy, right? There, there are sci-fi. And elements just a moment ago, kind of uh, Rafe tweeted something. So let me get my guests in here with me, and <laughs> probably let's, I would let's say get, let's put in talking. 70, 80 percent of the work. I got to be over the shoulder and be like, no. You, you're all ready. You're just done. I mean, this is like, uh, this is really like well. Um, and now I'm like, great, my turn. <laughs> and if you don't like that, um, you want to say, well, Robert Jordan could have made the two rivers all white. He could have, but he didn't. Just so, okay. yes, complimented me so, on my dress, and as you can clearly see, I'm sad. I just need to call me as something along the lines of a Shadar Haran analog. Or like it does make sense why it outlasted the breaking. Yeah. <laughs> See, yeah, you know, this is like why I have to res in the show because she's gonna correct everything that. Hey, everybody! I welcome to the Dusty Wheel really. Show. What? Beam off challenge! Yay! Like baby face mounted on like a huge body. So like all <laughs> this of is a not sudden, just a like, traditional wow. fantasy, right? There, there are sci-fi. And elements just a moment ago, kind of uh, Rafe tweeted something. So let me get my guests in here with me, and <laughs> probably let's, I would let's say get, let's put in talking. seventy, eighty percent of the work. I got to be over the shoulder and be like, no.